We'll go on now to a word from our sponsor, Spare the Air. And you can save gas, save money, and spare the air by turning off your car's engine if you'll be idling for more than 30 seconds. You'll be protecting your and your family's health. Whoops, went too fast. Uh, save money on gas. And as car exhaust is the number one source of air pollution in the Bay Area, by turning off your car, if you are idling for more than 30 seconds, you'll be helping to keep our skies blue. So if you're waiting to pick up someone from school, sports practice, or the library, if you're sitting at a drive through or a car wash, just turn your engine off. You can learn more at idlefreebayarea.org. I have to say, ever since I heard this, I've started turning my engine off. I never did before. I didn't know that's what we should do, but it's so easy to just turn the engine off and uh, while I'm sitting around in the car. Let's go now to Melissa Fiudi's garden in El Cerrito. So Melissa lives not far from my own home. And I remember driving by and seeing her large, steep, rocky corner lot before she bought it when it was covered in ivy and juniper. But now it looks like this. And here are a few more images just to set the stage. Uh, she has done a beautiful job of putting in some terraces and some uh, rock paths and wildflowers. Here's blue-eyed grass you might recognize from your walks in the hills and native fuchsia. And I'd like to go now and meet Melissa Fiuti. Good morning, Melissa. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you all? Good, thanks. Are you outside in your garden? I am not. I'm inside the office because oh. the Wi-Fi is not that great. You could have fooled me. It looks like you're sitting outside and it's a lovely background photo. Yeah, it's not sunset yet, so. That's right. <laughs> but that is my garden. That is my hillside um, and one of my favorite sunset blooming plants, which is the soap plant. It is beautiful. So when did you begin working on your garden? Um, you know, it's the past two years is when I really started to focus on it. Um, it's been a slow process, but we so only moved in um, about four years ago. Uh -huh. Your soap plant behind you is beautiful. Those white flowers are so pretty. And they flower at night or late in the afternoon and are pollinated by uh, native bees and moths. And I have heard that soap plant was used uh, by Native Americans to track time because only one flower opens on a stalk each day. So you could tell how long that stalk has been blooming. Uh, by oh, interesting. Flower opening. All right, well, shall we go now and watch your video? Yes, I can't wait. talking about which is plants I just you know I just love gardening and <laughs> I love supporting local ecology so let me show you around Welcome to my garden. Here is my front property. As you can see, we have a lot of coastal conditions coming in from the bay. And a lot of sun with a southern exposure, which is just magnified by the rock. Not a lot of soil. So these conditions are not very easy to work with. And however, I finally have gotten the knack of it through learning about native plants. So this front property 
isn't very habitable. I cannot spend a lot of time here having a picnic <laughs> with the steep incline and the jagged rocks. So it's really become a place for the critters and a place to hopefully inspire people of the different beautiful native plants of California. Um, there aren't very many native gardens, but I am seeing more and more every day and that makes me very happy. Um, so Staples of this garden is things that would have naturally been here. So I've got lots of coyote brush throughout, lots of sagebrush. With this kind of exposure, low nutrient rocky soil, those things just really thrive and they provide a lot of habitat. So down there I have baby toyon, um, woolly blue curls, and the one good thing about this bad soil, rocky, kind of poor, is that wildflowers just adore it, especially clarkia. So I've got lots and lots of clarkia. Unfortunately, the deer also love clarkia. So that's the front side. Let's go up. I'm looking down on this side. We have the extremely rare endemic Franciscan manzanita. It's little, but oh, it's doing really well. And over here, some rosy buckwheat, some verdacea, which I was hoping would bloom. But I don't think they will for this. Do you want to And then we come up to my backyard. I'm collecting seeds. Here's soap plant, one of my favorites. Garden. My daughter likes to play in this backyard, so I try to keep the space, you know, as conducive to play as possible and have it like a little fairy magic mixed in with some shady plants like ginger and um, native skullcap. is a willow tree that I just absolutely adore but I also have a little tiny oak in here. Um, I planted the willow hoping to use the material for basketry. Over here um, it used to just be like a dirt path and I've actually been able to make quite a little environment over here. I have um, a lot of coyote mint, um, a currant that's pretty young, um, a lot of uh, different kinds of mugworts. I've got coastal mugwort and um, the California street species, yerba buena. There is a coffee berry, which I have a few. Um, I'm sometimes moving plants around. Just recently, I put this iris into this spot because it was really struggling on the other side of the property and voila, blooms. So back over here, I'm 
I'll get some more coyote mint and then strawberries. Me and my kid will just kind of sit here and eat ripe ones off the vine. I also have a little native uh, wood rose and a nine bark tree. Mm. which even though it's not in the range, um, really attracts a lot of bees and I use it for medicine. Over here I have Cleveland sage, um, manzanita, this is the Dense Flora McMinn, and a lot of different kinds of Clarkia, which I'm really excited because these guys are about to bloom at the same time and it's just gonna be a purple and pink explosion. Melissa, that was terrific. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I know that you're an artist. Did you draw that butterfly? Yes, that was actually one of the butterflies that we raised that I then painted. Oh, it was beautiful. So was it on, was the caterpillar on one of your plants outside? Yes, but I've been taking them and letting them kind of reach their adult phase inside a tent uh -huh. um, because I, I ended up doing that and then I also bought mealworms to throw out to the birds because I didn't want to take away their food source. <laughs> well, your garden is just so beautiful and knowing what you started with before, because I remember when it was covered with ivy and juniper, you had your work cut out for you, didn't you? Yeah, and you know, I, I was hearing a earlier interview, I really look forward to the day where I don't have to water as much, but right now the way that that heat just gets in the middle of uh, the summer, I'm still having to water quite a bit. Yeah, well, you have an especially tough lot with that steep slope, it's so exposed, it's windy, it's rocky, like those are just the hardest of all the conditions, but you have just really done a marvelous job with it. It's It's been a challenge and it's definitely the thing that has led me to be really passionate about native plants. Kind of like- Because they're hardy and working well? That would work with that environment. Uh -huh. um, there was also ice on that hillside that I removed. So it was like all of the invasive plants you could think of. <laughs> so um, let's see. Um, how have you gone about selecting the plants that you have put in? I see you have a lot of local natives. How have you gone about finding them? Oh my God. So the local ones, I always go to um, the local nurseries that list where they're grown, so native here and um, watershed. And then beyond that, I've kind of gone through a lot of different phases. There was one time where I was just throwing whatever would stick on the hillside. Um, and then I started to really get into the different kinds of species and I kind of became like a collector. And then now I'm learning, oh, maybe that's not that great because I'm gonna be coming up with like a hybrid or messing with local. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of 
just starting to go back to that really local place again. Mm -hmm. So uh, you do some propagation, it looks like. What do you find that's, you know, kind of easy and fun to propagate that people might want to try at home and how could they begin? Oh, I love collecting seeds, especially from the wildflowers. Um, another thing that's really fun to propagate is uh, anything that you can just kind of trim and stick in the soil. Uh, so coyote mint is one of my favorites. So some of the things that you can trim and just stick in the soil would be a fuchsia, monkey flower, the mints, coyote mint, or some of the other salvias. Uh, those are easy ones that I can think of that um, if you have a plant at home, you can really just start making more yourself. Yeah, and I do that a lot um, during the winter when the ground's wet. So it's really just kind of like working with the seasons. I do spend a lot of time out there. Um, I am definitely the type that likes to kind of tinker and have my hands in the soil. So let me say, if you want to collect seeds, you should be collecting the wildflower seeds from your own garden and you can yes. buy wildflowers from the nurseries and watch them go to seed. And when they're ready to uh, drop their seed, you collect them in an envelope and keep it, you know, for a couple months. And uh, then you can look up online, like what to do with your seeds to have the best success. Do you just strew your wildflower seeds or do you put them in pots and then plant them out? I strew. Um, it's kind of left some dead spots, but <laughs> I, I feel like the pot way is just a lot of work to go with the soil, especially the things that I'm really propagating by pot are the perennials. So I've never had luck with strewing. I've strewed and strewed, but strewing doesn't, it rarely works for me. So I'm a potter. So when I want to grow a, a wildflowers or other plants from seeds, I put them in little pots and I keep them on the side and miss them. And um, I have much greater success. And then I just tease them apart and plant them out yeah. later. So I envy the strewers. Well, I think it's the rocky, the rocky area that the seeds, they just kind of go down and the birds can't come by and eat them because they're kind of stuck in the crevices where they wanna be. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of them, I just, the rest of the seeds I collect, I just give away to friends or anybody who wants them. <laughs> I'm just very much about like spreading these plants as much as possible, especially because a lot of people don't know about them. I, I know that you have been interested in edibles uh, from your garden, medicinals. Do you want to talk for a moment about some of the things that you've used from your garden? Oh yeah, I mean, it depends. You know, if my daughter has a cold, I'll be going out and grabbing that mint and the yerba buena. Um, some of my favorite teas is hummingbird sage and skullcap um, once it flowers in the summer is really great um, for helping you fall asleep at night. And edibles, the miner's lettuce. I mean, I, I love to be out there in the garden a lot, but I also just like the idea of just throwing some minor lettuce seeds and having a full garden full of salad. Um, that just kind of comes in the winter without having to amend any soil. And so I try to really stick to the edibles that are going to kind of take care of themselves. Tell me, how do you make hummingbird sage tea? I use a fresh leaf. I just go out and snip a little fresh leaf and let it sit in the water for about half hour. I'm going to try it. I have or a Not even. You don't even have to steep it that long. <laughs> I'm going to try that. Like Thank you. Taste. Okay, and um, what plants have you, well, let me see, what plants have you find found, you know, easy to grow? Like, what do you enjoy growing out from seed or propagating? Hmm. Well, I'm converting my lawn right now to yarrow. So that has been pretty fun to grow because it's something that gives you a success pretty easily as long as you keep the birds off of it. Um, I also love growing coast live oaks from seed. And as long as the squirrels, again, don't steal them. Have you found, a uh, question was, any specific plants that are good for slope stabilization? Is there anything that you've been glad you put on your slope? Yes. Um, I think it kind of really depends on where the person is and where, what hill where it's facing as far as sun, sun exposure. Um, for the sunnier areas, I've done 
grasses, which will help hold more of the perennial things like uh, buckwheats and coyote brush and sagebrush, which will just grow out of nothing. Mm. Um, on the other side where I have more shade, I grow like ceanothus, which is also really good for covering the soil. Mm -hmm. And we had a question. Um, did you find any plants that you planted that did not thrive in the seeds yes. per year? So what, what have been some of your oh. um, plants? Oh, it was, it was, it was terrible. Like I would plant something that I just absolutely loved and especially the ceanothus just baked on the hillside. Anything that was too small that I didn't plant at the right amount of time at the earlier season of winter would just, it wouldn't make it through the summer. Um, so there's been a lot of failures. Uh, <laughs> but then we have failures and that just kind of, uh, you have to think of it not as a failure, but just as an experiment and then try something else. It oh yeah. Took a while to get a grip on that to just, you know, not mind so much if something didn't go well. Now I'm starting to make everything look nice, but at first I just felt like the yard was this big science lab <laughs> where I could just try different things. So someone asked, uh, did you have native bee boxes? Yes, I do. I actually do quite a lot to create habitat for any kind of I, I never use pesticides. Everything's hand pull. Um, I have got a couple of uh, bee boxes and also the hillside because there's no foot traffic. I just see the digger bees just come right, right in and out <laughs> of the rocks. And I also leave like some old logs, which is good for, you know, salamanders. And I'm going to be burying more logs. We're going to be doing some replanting on our own front yard because we were remodeling and I'm going to stick a bunch of logs and just bury them oh, because yeah. the only times I have found salamanders and newts and lizards have been in half buried logs or or stick piles. Okay, let's see. There was a question. Um, uh, let's see. What does she use the white sage for? What do you? I use it for tea. Um, yeah. And how do you do that? You just steep it? You just pick some leaves and steep it? Yeah. And sometimes I will take a leaf and put it in a glass of water and let the water, um, kind of sit for like a half hour, maybe in the fridge in the summer. And that's pretty tasty. And someone asked, how did you propagate the soap plant? Did you propagate it from seed or? Yes, and you have to be very patient. <laughs> Again, learning from, I, I think with the with the yampa and the soap plant, you know, they're bulbs. And so you want to keep them in a pot probably and kind of like nurse them for the first two years. Do you Otherwise, talk about again, they will dry out and die because they won't get that soil depth or that enough food to kind of help them go. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you want to talk about some of your favorite wildflowers? You seem to have a lot of wildflowers in your garden. Oh, the Clarkia. Um, yeah, those Clarkias are beautiful. I love those Clarkias. I have them in my yard. I didn't, I actually had quite a little bit less of a show this year than last year. I think the deer were just a little extra hungry. And I know that you have uh, used the garden in your artwork. Yes, I love you know, all those photos. I'm out there with my camera and editing and just kind of really inspired by the plants, whether it's like going on a hike or doing a lot of the restoration work that I do, you know, anything I can to kind of support these plants that support everything else. Well, you are a beautiful photographer. Do you take your pictures with an iPhone or do you use a different camera? No, I use a, um, a Canon, Canon really uh, 5. I really enjoyed watching a video of you drawing a manzanita. Like I couldn't find it again. I found it once and it was a great video of you drawing out that manzanita. Is it on your website? No, it's on my Instagram mm -hmm. in my stories. Well, do you want to tell what your Instagram label is? Sure, it's, um, I can put it in the chat. It's Cali Flower Dreaming. And there's a lot of uh, beautiful photos there. I remember. And did you say you you do restoration work? Do you volunteer yes. around? Where do you volunteer? Um, locally in El Cerrito uh, at Canyon Trail Park, and I've also volunteered with other work groups in the city. There's trail truckers. There's 
there's there's quite a few <laughs> friends of five creeks is another one yeah and they could all use help i'm sure yes i i mean you know i'm lucky i have a garden um not everybody does and you know i i see that that is a privilege but everybody does have a local park that they could go and volunteer and try to plant some native plants at well, I want to thank you, Melissa, for your video. It was fantastic. The plant labels were great. The music was oh, fun. It was just really fun. So thank you so much. And um, will you be able to stay on the Zoom chat and maybe answer some questions that people had that we weren't able to get to? All yes. right. So Melissa, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.